Good morning. This is Aubrey Miller, the pastor at Faith Church, and we're glad to have you with us on this Sunday after Easter. God bless you. We hope you had a wonderful week last week. Before we get started in the worship and before we hear part two of Before and After, I'm going to ask you to get a sit back and get ready for praise and worship as Jace, Jay Halsey uh, and his family, they lead us into a period of praise and worship. Thank you. 
Awesome, awesome period of praise and worship. Thank y'all very, very much. We're glad uh, that everybody has joined us today for part two of Before and After. And, uh, you know, when we think about um, Easter and we think about resurrection, we think about crucifixion, Good Friday, and all that cool stuff that goes along with Easter, um, you know, we've got to break it down into manageable portions so that we can digest it all. And, you know, we wanted to take the opportunity to go a little bit deeper into the after part that we started last week. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look a little bit deeper into what was done after Jesus was resurrected, what was done with him, what was done with his disciples, and specifically what was done with Brother Peter. Because Peter was a focal point. He was a focal person in the after part of the resurrection. Let's pray for a moment. Father, in your precious name, lead us into your presence, lead us into your purpose, and lead us into a deeper understanding of your word. In the name of Christ, we pray it. Amen. Amen. There are two things we're going to talk about today, and one is from foolish fear to perfect peace, from foolish fear to perfect peace. And the second thing we're going to take a look at this morning is we're going to take a look at 
fishing for forgiveness, fishing for forgiveness. Now let's go back to that first part, that first element that we want to dive into. And we go to the gospel of John. John had a different perspective on the crucifixion and on the resurrection. And I think it's awesome because John was one of the only disciples that we know for a fact was there at the crucifixion because Jesus spoke from the cross to him and gave him instructions about his mother, Mary. So we wanted to go to John as we look at this after portion of the crucifixion, and we want to go specifically to chapter 20, and we want to go to verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, on the evening of the first day of the week, that's important, write that down, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. We need to break this down. We need to unpack it because there is so much truth in this scripture. we got to look at it piece by piece. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was such a radical, such an awesome event that it changed the calendars. Sunday became the first day of the week. Sunday became the first day of the week. Man, it's awesome the way God did that. That was such a cataclysmic change. It was such a radical departure from anything that anybody had ever seen that it actually changed the way the days are counted and the calendar is created. Jesus found his disciple, his disciples, in a room, locked up. And the Bible says that they were locked up because they feared uh, the Jewish leaders. They were in a secret room, but Jesus found them. He knew exactly where they were. He found them. And Jesus didn't knock on the door uh, because it was locked. He didn't have a key. He just appeared. And he just showed up in the room. He just manifested himself in the presence. And isn't it cool the way God will sometimes do that in your life? He will just manifest himself in the middle of your fear, in the middle of your frustration, in the middle of your worry. He'll just show up. And you didn't ask him in, you didn't expect him to come in, but because of the intimate and close relationship that you have with God and the close and intimate relationship you maintained with Jesus, he just showed up. He showed up and he showed himself up in that room where he was surrounded by 11 disciples who were afraid. They were just absolutely afraid. Jesus didn't knock on the door. He didn't have a key. He just appeared. And the emotional state of these guys was one of fear. And Jesus knew this. And the reason he had an opening line when he went in was because he knew their state. He knew their condition. He knew what was going on. And the first word that he said to them wasn't, hey, what's up, bro? How you doing? How's it going? No, he didn't say any of that because he knew exactly how it was going. Because if he didn't know how they were doing, then he wouldn't know what to say. But he knew what to say. And here's what he said. Peace be with you. Isn't that great? He, he, he knew exactly what they needed to hear for two reasons on two levels. First of all, they were troubled at the fact that they were concerned that the Jewish leaders were going to find them and kill them. The second thing that they were afraid about, they were afraid about this appearance of this person in the room that they didn't let in, Jesus. You know how sometimes we're praying for the Lord to come into our lives and he'll do something that'll scare us to death. And this is what happened to them. They were afraid to death of not only the Jewish leaders, but they were afraid of Jesus because they didn't know truly who he was. And he had to do some things to manifest and to explain to them who he was. And he did it very easily. First of all, he allayed their fears. And the thing he told them was, you know, peace be with you. And then the next thing he did was he showed them, he revealed his mangled body. He showed them the nail prints in his hands and the piercing in his side. And they knew immediately, 
hey, man, this is somebody we knew. He knew just what they needed, and he spoke it. He said, peace be with you. And when they heard his voice and when they saw the nail prints in his hands, peace was indeed with them, and the Bible says that they were overjoyed. And that's kind of what we experience from time to time. We become overjoyed when we understand that Jesus has shown up in our circumstances. And so his first peace be with you um, works so well, Jesus thought he'd say it again. He thought he'd say it one more time. And this is in verse 21. In verse 21, he says, and again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And then he gave them some instruction. Look at the next part of the sentence. As the Father has sent me, he said, I am sending you. Now, you've got to think about this because the Father sent him to manifest salvation to his people. He finished and completed that on the cross. And now, you know, there's a lot packed into this statement that he's saying to the disciples when he says to them, as he sent me, I'm sending you, I am sending you to do what I started, to do what I have done for your benefit. In verse 22, and with that, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, man. The guy has given them perfect peace twice, fear about what was going to happen to them from outsiders, and then Peace be with them, you know, relieving and allaying the fears that they had about what might happen to them from this, you know, unannounced, uninvited person into the room who was actually Jesus. And now he's given them a bonus. He's given them a bonus. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, listen, that's fresh air. If you ever wanted to get a breath of fresh air, That is fresh air because, you know, Jesus has breathed into us at creation the breath of life. When we are able to receive the new breath of the Holy Spirit breathed into us by Jesus, oh, man, that is truly, that is truly a breath of fresh air. That is awesome. So the breath of fresh air was for the entire group of disciples for for all of them but Jesus had a special he had a special illustration for who Peter (laughs) you know Peter was that guy if you recall uh, he was a guy who said man I'll never I'll never leave you Jesus I'm gonna always be by your side I'm gonna be your boo I'm gonna be your boy I'm gonna be right here with you but you know in truth he denied Jesus three times so the second message um, in in verse 23 is specifically for Peter because remember these guys have gone from foolish fear to perfect peace they were in this room they were afraid Jesus has allayed their fears and he has taken the Holy Spirit and he has filled them with this Holy Spirit that is just great stuff but look at verse 23 And this, remember, this is alluding to Peter. This is Jesus saying to Peter, you have been fishing for forgiveness. You've been fishing for forgiveness. I got it for you. Verse 23, if you forgive anyone's sins. Now, remember, he's talking to everybody, but he is really pointed toward Peter. Their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, They are not forgiven. That's a big authority to give to a bunch of fishermen, to a bunch of tax collectors, to a bunch of guys who are not theologians, who are not, you know, necessarily preachers. But, oh, man, these guys have had such a wonderful experience working and walking with Jesus. He's trusting them. He is entrusting them with a ministry that is going to go on into this present day. And he said, you know, in its simplest form, what I want you to do is understand that you have power, and the power is to forgive sin. Your sins are forgiven, and if you don't forgive the sins of others, he says they're just not forgiven. And he has given them a great work. So now we want to look at this 
relationship that Jesus had with Peter, this purpose and coming that he had reserved for Peter. It's for everybody, but it is sure enough for Peter. So we're going to look at this fishing for forgiveness. So just forgive me if I just take a minute to just unpack this word because I think it's so powerful. But look at verse 1, very powerful word. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. You know, the first time was in that room. Now the second time he's a appearing to them uh, by the Sea of Galilee. And here's the way it happened uh, in verse 2. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Now look at verse 3. He says, I'm going out to fish. Now that's not Jesus, that's Peter. Simon Peter told them, and they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out, and they got into the boat, but that night, they caught nothing. They caught absolutely nothing. They were returning to their old profession. They were returning to their old normal. They were going back uh, to the pre-disrupted lives that they had enjoyed. And, you know, they got the Zebedee Fishing Company, and they went back out to fish. They went right out there. And Peter was the first one who said, I'm going fishing. Don't you kind of feel that way sometimes? I'm just going fishing. I'm just going to go back and do what I used to do. I'm going to go and I'm going to play some sandlot football. I'm going to just go do what I used to do before I met Jesus. And, of course, you got friends who have nothing better to do. So they said, okay, Peter, we're going with you. These guys were fishermen. This is what they were. This is what they did. They had a company. This is what this was their means of living. This was their support. And this is what they had been doing before Jesus disrupted their lives. And it was natural for them. It was natural for them uh, to return to their work after the disruption of their ministry. It, it was a natural thing to do to go back to what they were doing. But as it turns out, the fishing business was really no better than the disrupted state of the ministry with Jesus crucified because they fished all night and they caught nothing. Have you ever been in a situation like that? I know I have. I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you have just gone back to what you thought was normal and you thought it was going to be so cool and you thought it was going to be so awesome and you got out there and it was a dud? I mean, you, you had your mind set on going to your favorite restaurant and you were going to have your favorite meal and you were going to sit down. It was the worst meal you have ever had. And it just did not meet your needs. And they went out there and they fished. The Bible took painstaking effort to say they fished all night. And have you ever worked so hard at something? You know, you worked all night. You gave it all your energy. You gave it all your expertise. And in the process of doing it, you got nothing back. You have nothing to show. You have no fish. You have no anything. This is what these guys experienced. And, I mean, I think it's just awesome the way God set this thing up. And in the second meeting that Jesus had with the disciples, they were exhausted. They had spent the entire night out there trying to fish. And Jesus, unbeknownst to them, was on the shore, and he called out to them. They didn't know who he was, but he called out to them. And he said, hey, <laughs> what you guys doing out there? And, you know, what did you catch? Did you catch anything? Now, this proves to me that God has a sense of humor. I mean, he absolutely has a sense of humor because, number one, Jesus knew they hadn't caught anything. And he, I mean, just rubbed salt in the wounds. And he also knew that they didn't know who he was. But he asked, he said, friends, have you any fish? Well, of course, their answer was no. And, and, you know, don't you just love a smart aleck who comes up to you when you know you haven't been successful at doing something? And, you know, they just ask you the most obvious question and you don't even want to answer it because you don't want to come to reality to what you really have done or failed to do. And they said, no, we haven't caught anything. And then verse 6, he said, tell you what you do. Now, this is a guy on the shore 
who's obviously not a fisherman, and if they knew it was Jesus, they'd have been even more outraged. But, but he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some fish. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. The Bible says in a couple of places there's like 153 fish. That's a lot of fish for one net. And for the Zebedee Fishing Company, I mean, that was a, that was, that was huge. All of us from time to time, we enter a period of disruption. I mean, you, you, you do that, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not the only one, right? I hope not. And they had their lives disrupted for sure. You know, and, and you get your life disrupted. You lose a job. You lose a love. You lose a dream. You lose a hope. You lose in some cases, lose your mind. You lose perspective. And then somewhere between midnight and dawn, you get a glimpse of a familiar image in the middle of your mess. Come on, you ever done that? In the middle of your divorce, in the middle of your stand in the line down at the unemployment office, as you muddle at the dining room table over bills that you can't pay, as you walk through relationships that are broken and busted that you can't fix, as you look at your pre-30 hopes and dreams, and now you're 50, and there's no chance that you're ever going to accomplish what you thought you were going to accomplish. And then something, some image, some visage, some person, some, I don't know, apparition appears in a distance. And you get direction to do something a little bit different from what you have been doing. You've been fishing on one side of the boat. And this image comes and this image says, throw your nets on the other side. Well, some of us... If we don't know who it is, we're not going to take advice from somebody we don't know or somebody we don't recognize. But something in the hearts of these disciples recognized. They weren't sure, but it just seemed like it may be somebody they know. Whatever it was, it was enough for them to take their nets and to do as he had instructed. I mean, these were... These were Fishermen who had been fishing all their lives. And if they didn't catch fish on one side of the boat, they had no idea how they were going to catch fish on the right side of the boat. But something about that guy, something about that voice, you hear it. You hear it at night. You hear it in the morning. You hear it, and you call it coincidence, or you hear it, I heard something inside of me. It's not something inside of you. It's that Holy Spirit that Jesus breathed into them. It's the Holy Spirit that Jesus breathed into you, that Holy Spirit that Jesus has breathed into me. Back to Peter, because remember, he was fishing for forgiveness. Peter messed up, man. He just flat out messed up, and he needed to be forgiven. I mean, he was carrying this guilt around in him. In addition to being afraid of everything, Peter was also feeling pretty bad. And Jesus was setting him up for a, a boost up. So all this time, this period of time leading into the dawn, you get this glimpse of a familiar image in the middle of your mess. In verse 7, then the disciple um, whom Jesus loved, and you know that's John, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, he said, Pete, it's the Lord. <laughs> now, it's cool the way John is the first one to actually not only notice that it's Jesus on the shore, but he's the one who announces that it's Jesus on the shore. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, 
I mean, just like Peter. Peter is a reactionary. Peter, I mean, if somebody says, you know, let, let's have a foot race. Well, Peter's already on the starting line. And the Bible says Peter had taken off his outer garment and he must have been out there sweating, catching those fish. He took it and he wrapped it around himself to cover himself. You know, and I had to giggle at that point because I got to thinking, you know, what if... You know, God came back, you know, Jesus came back and really caught us, you know, really trying to solve our problems and really trying to fix our problems. And we have, you know, we've, un we've stripped down to our underwear and we're just out there. We're just working hard. We don't expect to see anybody. We don't expect to hear anybody. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. Oh, Peter got his stuff and he just wrapped himself up um, and he, he didn't wait till the boat got to where Jesus was, he did exactly the same thing that he did when Jesus saw him or he saw Jesus coming when they were out on that boat. And Peter said, Jesus, if it's you, just tell me to come and I'll come to you. Man, he jumped out of that boat. He got in the water. He got wet. He started swimming. He started walking. He started dog paddling. He was on his way to Jesus. Peter had been fishing for fish. But I don't know whether Peter was fishing with all of his energy. You know, sometimes you go out and you work, but your heart's not really in it because you're scared because you're worried, because you don't know what the future is going to bring. You don't know what your outcome is going to be. You don't know what your come out is going to look like. You don't know what it's going to be like on the other side. So your whole energy is really not in it. Peter's whole energy probably was not in the fishing. Now, I don't know that for a fact, but I'm just basing it on how I feel sometimes when it just looks like things are not going the way they're supposed to go. And the diversions that I create, I can't put my whole energy into them. I just can't do it. And I suspect that that's one of the reasons they didn't catch anything is because their hearts were not totally in it. They've been fishing half-heartedly. So ever since Peter denied Jesus uh, three times, he was starving for an economic uh, stimulus, but that was not really what he really wanted or needed. Yeah, he didn't have a job anymore necessarily. He was a tent maker, but he could have gone back and done that. But he said, I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. That's just something I can do without even thinking about it. I don't have to put a lot of energy into it but the thing that was really on Peter's mind and this is what he was really fishing for was forgiveness he had denied Jesus three times and Jesus told him that he would deny him and Peter needed forgiveness he needed to be um, he needed to be set up in a better way go to verse 9 when they landed when the boat landed they saw a fire burning coals with fish already on them. I mean, get, get the image of this now. These guys have been out fishing all night. They got this guy calling out, hey, throw your nets on the other side. They do it. They catch fish. They get tired. They understand and realize that this is Jesus. Peter gets out. He swims out to him. And when he gets there, Jesus has already got a fire started. He's already got fish cooking. He's already got bread laid aside. I mean, can you just really get this? I mean, these guys are out trying to get what Jesus already had. Jesus' provision goes ahead of his vision. He already has what those guys are out there looking for. And he also has what Jesus, what Peter is looking for, and that's forgiveness. Look at verse 12. Jesus said to them, come have breakfast. <laughs> I love it. Come and have breakfast. Uh, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? That mean, that's what the Bible says. They knew it was the Lord. Verse 13, Jesus came, he took the bread, he gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. And verse 14, this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
<laughs> Notice how everything appears in threes. Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus appeared to these guys three times. And here we are. Now it's time for Peter to get what he wanted. He didn't really want any fish. The dude wasn't hungry. He didn't want any breakfast. But he got what he wanted more than a fish sandwich. He got forgiveness and reinstatement. Well, pastor, where do you see that? Well, I see it beginning at verse 15. Take a look with me. When they had finished eating, Jesus said specifically, not to all the disciples, he said specifically to Simon Peter. Here's what he said. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, I want to stop right there, and I want you to notice the name that Jesus gave to Peter. Remember, he had named him previously, and what did he name him? He named him Peter, the rock. But look at what he calls him now. He said, Simon, son of Jonah. I mean, he's reverting back to Peter's humanity, to his pre-disruption name of Simon. He answered, yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now notice, that's the first question that he asked him. Look at verse 16. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And each one of these loves, he's He's speaking of a different kind of love, agape, phileo. He's using the different ones. And Peter answered. He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus answered, said, he said, take care of my sheep. Third time, verse 17, he said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? (laughs) And Peter was hurt. Because Jesus asked him the third time, one, two, three. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? One, two, three. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. In three simple statements, questions and answers, Jesus reinstated Peter by each time asking him, do you love me? Giving Peter a chance to say three times, I love you. And every time, Jesus gives him an order. He gives him a mission. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you have been through. All I'm saying is this. In the before, when life was in the what you might call the good old days, in the middle of your disruption, in the middle of your frustration, in the middle of your tough times, You may not have performed the way that you thought you would have performed, the way you promised Jesus that you were going to perform. Your pastor is here to tell you this morning with all the love and function in my heart that Jesus is ready to reinstate you. Jesus is ready to forgive you. He is ready to welcome you back and to put you on a mission. So many of us have given up ministry, have given up the work of the Lord because we, we, we went wrong. We made a misstep. We made a mistake. God knew you were going to make the mistake. He knew you were going to make the error. But God made a way to come back to him. And he set us up to be forgiven. And all of our sins have the ability to be wiped away because God wants to reinstate you. God wants to forgive you, and God wants you to go out and forgive other people. That is the most powerful part of the ministry. Salvation was started on the cross, and it covered the salvation of many. But Jesus has a desire for you and me to individually be forgiven and for all of us to be reinstated and ready to go. I'll close with this. There was a time in my life when I knew the Lord. 
I knew about the Lord. I've heard about the Lord in church and all of this kind of stuff. And I was one of those guys who went to church and threw spitballs in the choir stand and did all of this stuff. And I went to the evening service. I went to Methodist youth. I did all that stuff. But I was a jerk. I mean, flat out, I was a jerk. But man, when I finally got a chance to meet Jesus and know who he truly was, I realized that I had been a jerk. And I just, you know, God forgave me long before I accepted his forgiveness. He looked at me and he said, when are you going to get up off your butt and go and do what I told you to do? Well, Lord, I just am not worthy. I'm just not worthy. God said, I told you to get up. I told you to get up. There's got, I got stuff for you to do. Ladies and gentlemen, God's got stuff for you to do. You have your own before. Jesus has a clear picture of your after. It's time to get up off the couch. It's time to get up off of whatever it is you're feeling bad about and to accept the reinstatement and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. He died for you, and he died for me. And all he wants us to do is to come and have breakfast. The fish is already cooking, and he wants to welcome you back. Will you accept? Wherever you are, if you're in your living room, if you're in your kitchen, you're in your den, Wherever you are right now, and you're hearing this word, this is not just Aubrey Miller talking. This is, a, this is an invitation from Jesus to give your life back to him and to allow him to use you. Let him finish the work that he started in you. Let him finish the mission that he has given to you. Get up. Go eat breakfast. The provision's already there. Fish are already frying. The coals are already hot. And even the bread's there. Get up. Take your family. Take your coworkers. Take your neighbors. Return to Jesus. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have been following the word that has been shared with you today, simplistic, nothing complicated, straight up the word of God, just openly defined. If you've heard that word and you've made a decision today, what we want you to do is we want you to just stay right where you are. We want you to just close your eyes. We want you to bow your knees if it's possible and just want you to just confess, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I am so grateful that you've given me the opportunity to be saved. I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. And if you pray that prayer, God has accepted you and received you. Let somebody know about it. Get on the phone. Call somebody who has planted a seed in your life and say, listen, I get it. I got it. I'm cool. Go to our website faithchurchoxmoor.org and at the end of all the scroll down pages there's a place where you can leave your name can tell us what decision you've made and what we'll do is we'll pray with you about all the cool things that God is able to do in your life going forward will you do that thanks well God bless you if we were in church what we always do for the benediction, we don't do one of those little, you know, mamby-pamby, you know, benedictions. We, we ask everybody to put all their hands up, you know, so, you know, just basically I surrender. And we say things like this. I believe that God has done some great stuff, and I'm going to live in it. Will you do it? Amen. And God bless you. I'll see you next week.